In this particular video here though, we're gonna talk about the robotics side of things. And when I say robotics, I'm gonna say robot. Because whenever somebody says robotics to me, I think about the entire system. I think about the entire machinery, the entire piece of equipment. Now, when it comes to the robotic side of things and jumping into the robot side of things specifically, I wanted to dive in on this and, and talk about a few things that you could learn about robots or about robotics that will help you to get started in your career and potentially find a job doing different type of robotics tasks, maybe a robotics programmer. So the first thing to really get you to understand about robots, I would start to understand the different types of robot in the market and the different brands that are in the market. So I'm gonna go ahead and mention a few, but definitely do your own research. So there's brands of robot, which would be Fanuc, Yaskawa, KUKA, Universal Robot, Nachi, Kawasaki. Okay, I just listed off a few. If I didn't mention your robot name, I'm sorry. So these are just a few different robot brands on the market, but you should know the different brands that are in the market. And I also advise you knowing what is the most popular brand for your area. So a couple things to keep in mind with that, depending on the country that you're located in, might have a very big impact on what robots are popular in your area. It, for example, in the United States, generally Fanuc is the most popular robot. Allen Bradley is the most popular PLC. So having those things in mind while moving forward in your career uh, is very, very important. Now, maybe you're outside of the US and so, you know, maybe Siemens is the primary PLC and maybe KUKA is the primary robot. This is something you may even want to try to reach out to the manufacturer in your area and find out like what robots do you guys use? I mean, it's kind of like a weird request to, to think about doing, but if you can find some type of in reaching out to people on Facebook that work in a particular area, I'll give you a good example is we have a Toyota just right up the street from us. And at Toyota, uh, a lot of times these vehicle manufacturers will use like a Kawasaki or a Nachi or some robot that may not be the, the most popular robot in the industry. Uh, whenever, like I said, like Fanuc is one of the most popular in the United States, but whenever it comes to a, a Toyota, they default with this one robot brand, and this is the robot brand they use across pretty much their entire facility. Now, this is not necessarily always the case. Sometimes they have large pieces of equipment that are, you know, maybe most of it's notchy, but this whole line over here is all Fanuc. So there might be different mixes, but the, the reason why this is important is because maybe you're gonna go work at that Toyota facility, right? And so it's better that you try to learn on a, a notchy robot or something that they may have in their facility because uh, that's going to set you up for success to, to get a position at that job. If you were to call them and say, I have Fanuc experience, versus if you called them and said, I have Nachi experience, they say, oh, you have Nachi experience, we have Nachi robots everywhere. So, you know, come on down, apply, you'll have the job. Another thing is knowing different types of robots. When it comes to different types of robots, there's robots that are known as six axis, Scara robots, Gantry robot, maybe a servo robot. So all these different robot types are different types of robots that you need to understand they exist, right? And understand what the difference between those robots. So maybe I could say a gantry robot, and then you have an understanding that that's like an XYZ coordinate style robot and likely doesn't have articulation in the wrist. But so also knowing the different types of uh, robots that are on the market. And some of these robots, like a gantry robot, may not be what a traditional robot or a robot that you would think of as a, as a traditional robot. It's not like a Fanuc six axis robot, which is very traditional and, and probably have seen in some type of YouTube video or something along those lines. But a gantry robot is also still a robot, but maybe it's a servo driven type of robot. Again, not considered exactly a robot, but being able to identify these things and, under, and identify like how the system works. If you can start really picking apart how systems work, that'll take you, take you a long way. So when it comes to something like a Fanuc robot, all the technology is integrated across all those axes, meaning all the motion. You, whenever you drive it, there's all kinds of algorithms that are calculating the uh, position of each motor to ensure the proper position at the, at the TCP or the point of that robot. Whereas something like a gantry style robot, you might have to set up a lot of those things and you might have to train the system to understand that it is a three axis robot and this is the negative limit, this is the positive limit, and there's a lot of things that might go into that. And understanding that it's a, like a servo-based system where each servo is essentially isolated until you train it that these servos are all connected and can now do a coordinated motion or, or teach it like a TCP where now you can teach it a specific position. So when it comes to the robot side of things, I mean, I highly advise like if you're gonna do something in the robot side that it's, it's programming, there's really not a lot that you can do. You can either do like mechanical maintenance or PMing or programming. There's not like a ton of other things. Like you could maybe find a, a job with, some, with a company that's like 
some type of development person where you're working on like the back end of like a Fanuc robot and working on like special new tools and stuff that are in there. But that's gonna be like a very few people and a very small group of, of team members in the world that are, that are doing something like that. There might be five, 10, maybe 15 guys in like the United States that are in that, that department that are uh, doing the back end development of, of like these, ro these robot systems. So it's more likely that you're gonna actually be programming these robots for a manufacturing type of operation like we do here at our company. So I highly advise that you start to understand programming, programming structures, and that also kind of takes us into some of the other things that you need to learn, right? When it comes to programming, there's the programming of the robot, but then you have to have an understanding of some of the other, let's say, tools of the robot. And tools of the robot might be something like the I.O. So robot I.O., you might know what I.O. is, input, output, and so you may not know though that there's different types of I.O. in a robot. The robot I.O. is segregated into a couple different things. So you have your inputs, you have your outputs. Uh, depending on your brand, it might be called something different, but you have your group inputs, you have your group outputs. Uh, and so what's your difference between your, your inputs and your outputs, or your digital inputs and your digital outputs? Uh, versus a group input and a group output. I'll go ahead and give you that example now. The group input is going to be something along the lines of a data number, right? It's gonna be like a number 10, a number 12. So if, if you have to tell your robot something like you've picked up 10 parts, you can do that by sending it a number 10 through a group input. If the robot wants to tell the PLC, hey, I have, I've gotten 10 parts, then it can send that number to the PLC. And what are some what are some areas where you might use something like this? You might use this for counting. You might use this for recipe dependence. With recipe dependence meaning we're running different part numbers of something, and I need the robot to switch programs based on that part number we're giving it. So maybe this is part number 37. So we can feed the robot a part number 37. Maybe it, it just it adjusts its entire program to adapt to part number 37. Maybe your pickup height's different. Maybe your drop-off location's different. Maybe the tooling that the robot's using has to go and switch its tooling for a different tooling. These are all different use cases of using the digital input or output. And but when it comes to the digital inputs and outputs, those are generally an on-off type of signal. And this will also take us to handshaking. So handshaking is the communication back and forth between devices. So this means, hey, I'm done with this. The PL says, says, okay, I heard that you're done with it. So that's a handshake. The robot says something to the PLC, the PLC says something back. So maybe on digital output 12, the robot is gonna say, okay, I'm done doing this thing, right? On digital input 12, the PLC will give back, okay, I heard you, done. So that there is a handshake. You told the PLC, the PLC then told you back. Now, actually the handshake could be one way. It could be just the digital output of the robot saying, I'm done. The input coming back is what we would call an acknowledgement. An acknowledgement meaning just that it verified that it happened. So in older systems, you used to have to do this to kind of verify the handshake. It's really something that's not absolutely needed now. Now we kind of just consider it an interlock, but it's, it's something that, that was really taken from older systems. And the reason, reason why it was utilized in older systems is because whenever you sent a signal, sometimes that signal wouldn't reach whatever it is you're trying to reach. So like, let's say for instance, I told this PLC I'm done. Maybe between the PLC and, and, and the robot, there's a, a relay. Maybe that relay didn't switch. And so therefore the, the PLC never got the signal. Or maybe the IO point of the PLC went out and so it didn't read that signal. Or maybe the output of the robot went out so it didn't send the signal. Right. So back then you used to do the acknowledgement handshake where you sent the signal and then you'd wait to hear back from the PLC to say, I've heard the signal. We still utilize this. But again, the reason why it's not as important to use today is just because when it comes to the Ethernet communication, if you lose Ethernet communication, you generally lost your safety signal. At least in our systems you do, you lose your safety signal. You lose all other communication, which would then throw some other fault to the robot, causing it to just stop doing whatever its process is anyway. Really that acknowledgement in today's age doesn't do anything in that functionality. If anything, it helps catch programmer mistakes. And also this is just an example of how to use 
inputs and outputs and how that communication works between the different devices. So know what those different digital or know what those different IOs are. Learn about the IOs themselves. Uh, for one another example is you have robot IO, which is the IO that's uh, used on the robot uh, and internally to the robot. So you have, uh, for example, a FANUC robot has an EE connector. On that EE connector, there's the RO signals. Okay, so you're able to fire the robot outputs uh, on that EE connector, which means anything that you put up here on the end of arm tooling, that's how you would actuate that. Again, now today we don't use the, the, the robot input and outputs as much because we've converted over to ethernet based. So now most robots have an ethernet cable running up the arm and then whatever module we have up here is ethernet based and then all of our IO and everything's here on this module. Uh, one, because it just gives us a lot more IO and also because we just need ethernet and we need power. That's the only thing we need to up there on that module and we can swap that module out and it's two plug connectors done. So again, we're not using robot inputs and outputs as often anymore, but it's important to know because like a lot of older systems use that type of methodology and there might be some customers that say, we want it this way because that's how all our other robots are set up. Uh, we generally don't see a ton of that anymore, but this it is, a, it is uh, the case in some instances. Now I want to talk to you guys about registers and position registers. So a register, and this is also FANUC robot as well, but a register is basically a place to store that data. So I was talking about the group inputs and outputs before. If you had a group input coming in with a number 10 coming into that, you would take that, that group input and set it equal to a register. So if you said group input one, set it equal to register one, this group input would then take the data, so number 10, and shove it into the register. So now register one is equal to 10. And then in your program, you can utilize that that says like register one, uh, if register one is equal to 10, or if, yeah, if register one is equal to 10, do this thing. If it's not equal to 10, do this other thing, right? And so you're able to utilize those different registers, different register numbers in your program to make different decisions within the program. You can also utilize a register and have to utilize a register for math. So like if I wanted to increment something, I might say, uh, maybe every time we scan in the program or every time we do a function that we, we add one. So you could say register uh, in your program, it would say register one is equal to register one plus one. So this gives you another tool to utilize in your program. Then there's also program instructions that you need to learn. So uh, FANUC Robot, there's an instruction button on one of your F keys. You need to look through those instructions, understand what those different instructions do. You have things like if statements, you have if, if then else sta statements now. Uh, so there's a bunch of different types of if, if statements. My favorite if statement is like if and then like the parentheses so where you can like build out your own if statement. But there's some uh, a couple other ones that are very important like a call, which means you're gonna call another program. There's jump and label. So uh, jump is like jump to a label. So, you know, it, say for instance, when, you, when you're doing like a loop in a program, if it's like the main loop, then, you know, maybe you have like 100 at the bottom or you have a jump label uh, 10 at the bottom and you have label 10 at the top. So the program will run through all the way to the bottom and then it'll say jump to label 10, which is back at the top. And then so that's how the function of the program works. That's how you create a loop. When I say loops, I mean labels and skip to labels or jump to labels. When I say a call, that's just a call uh, program and it's just call and then you gotta put whatever program it's gonna be there. Your inputs and your outputs, right? You're gonna use your digital inputs and your digital outputs, and you're gonna use your group inputs, your group outputs, your registers, all throughout your programs. Uh, so, you know, have a good understanding of those things, and that's gonna really take you a long way in being able to uh, take your programming skills to the next level. If you can get your hands on a programming simulation software, RoboGuide offers a 30-day free trial. So if you can get your hands on that and get that 30-day free trial, then you'll be able to learn a little bit of stuff. There, your college might even have some uh, special offer with FANUC themselves or one of the other uh, robot makers with, uh, I believe uh, Yaskawa has RoboSim and they have a simulation software. So they might offer some special college package where you can get that free or at little cost 
and be able to take that home and, and utilize that simulation software. That's the exact same as being able to program on the real world robot. So that's probably one of the best things that you can do if you have that capability of doing that. Again, you should be able to get access to the 30 day free trial. Maybe you have to call a fan sales rep or something like that, but you should be able to get that free trial. And you know, you put that free trial on as many computers as you want. So if you don't just buy a bunch of computers, you can keep keep extending that license. If not, it's like a couple thousand dollars a year, which is super expensive or like a 10,000 for a one-time license. So it is a very, very expensive thing if you're actually gonna pay for it and, it and there's not stuff like college sponsorship. But again, learn some of these programming things. If you have any other particular questions, I can make some like programming videos, but it's just super time consuming for me and I don't really have the time to be able to sit and open up RoboGuide and show you guys exact programming methods. But maybe it's something I'll do. Maybe it's something that I'll have the, time, the ability to do here in the near future. Thank you guys for watching this one. Hopefully this was insightful. And make sure to hit the subscribe button for more content like this. Or check out the Manufacturing Come Up where we talk about manufacturing careers and how to navigate your career in the manufacturing space. Thank you guys again and we'll catch you on the next one.